I could have kept singing and forget about the preaching. I'm sure some of you are thinking that as well. But that's okay. Welcome to uh, you all. Um, those uh, here, maybe here for the first time, we want to welcome you. And as we do say and mean, you're not um, a visitor, you're our guest. So if we can do anything for you, please let us know. As already said, QR code. Find out if there's anything that uh, you need that we can help you with. You can find it there. And anyone else, for that matter, who has been a part of the church and, and maybe hasn't even done growth tracks or you're not baptised and you've, you're working out, well, do I need baptism? Do I, what, is, what it's all about? Please see us because as far as I'm concerned and beyond my concern and more in the authority of the Word of God, the Bible does speak about us repenting and being baptised. And it's a, a big step in our Christian life where we align ourselves and we also publicly acknowledge that Jesus Christ, the work on the cross, is what we have faith in and whom we believe in and who is our saviour. And I can tell you now that it's probably that place where the enemy, called the devil, speaks to us about and says, well, I don't need baptism. The fact of the matter is, is my Bible tells me that if we want to understand the things of God, there are processes. And although those processes aren't laws, they are on God's heart. And in the New Testament, he speaks about all of those things. And baptism is one of those powerful works in our lives. Amen. Let's just pray, Father. I just thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity of being able to be here as a church, still public, still being able to open our doors freely. We think of those in places that uh, we've spoken about in the past. Right now, we pray for them, or even doing church underground, those that are being uh, burnt at the stake, Lord, those that are they're, they're being put asunder because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And at this stage in this country, you haven't called us to go down that road. So, Lord, we want to take every opportunity while there's still time, while you remain away, to be a witness, to be salt and light of the earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, today I just want to continue speaking into what I would say is the practical and the exciting reality of what Christian life looks like with the person of the Holy Spirit. And I want to continue going down that road. And, uh, and it's a bit of a series without being an official series. And I know that uh, Pastor Peter is going to speak about that uh, next week as well. But I want us to understand that God himself tells us in his word that he's given us the Holy Spirit, the promise of God through Jesus Christ. And anyone that's born again of the Spirit of God today has the gift known as the Holy Spirit. And during this church's journey, I have consistently on a number of occasions spoken about the character traits of the Holy Spirit, which you can find on our uh, YouTube page under Centerpoint Church. And uh, please go to it and refresh yourself. Those, those messages aren't just there to be left, but they are for us to remind ourselves. So just in brief, before we move on, I just want to touch on the character traits, the main character traits, and it speaks about him in John in this way. And first of all, what I do want to say is that the Holy Spirit is God. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. Okay? He's not a, a lesser being. He's not the third person because he came, uh, first came the Father, then came the Son, then came the Holy Spirit. No, God exists in eternity. And each of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are God equally, but each of them have a different role to play in our life. So first of all, I want to say that the Holy Spirit is God. He's the third person of the Trinity, and his official entrance on the earth was made at Pentecost, which I shared last week. And having said that, he just didn't come and go. He stayed. He now remains as the provider, as the protector, and as the sustainer of the grace of God. Those that don't know, this period in the New Testament is known as the grace period, that God shows us grace. That if we would be in the Old Testament, God would deal with us in a different way because the Holy Spirit was not here. But now he, he, he and Jesus and the Holy Spirit got together and they were desperate. So desperate were they that Jesus came and died on the cross. 
Because all through the Old Testament, we see that the children of Israel, those that God wanted to bring near to him, there was always something breaking down. So he said, kings won't do it, priests won't do it, the Lord doesn't do it, the prophets can't help me, I'm going to go myself. And praise God that he came himself, and you and I find ourselves in that period called grace. So the Holy Spirit is God's protector, God the protector, God the sustainer, and God the provider of grace. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is, is your helper. The Bible speaks about it. He's a comforter, a counsellor. He helps you to pray. He helps you to worship. This morning, he was helping me to worship. I'm enjoying worship because the Holy Spirit is helping me. He helps me in my personal life, in the life as a man, in the life as a woman, as a husband, as a wife. He's our personal helper. And we need to understand that we need to go to him. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit is your teacher. He brings clarity. Everybody say clarity. He brings clarity. He separates religion and tradition from the truth. He reveals truth. He lights it up in our life. He brings kingdom alignment, meaning that we, he sets us on that course with the truth of God, brings alignment to our life, sometimes when we're out of alignment. And he rightly divides the word of God. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And lastly, the Holy Spirit is your life leader. The Bible says that he's here to lead us into all truth. He guides, directs you, steers you towards God and gives you direction. In fact, I often say he's your senior partner. And thank God for the Holy Spirit because if the Holy Spirit was not here, let me tell you, more of us wouldn't be here in this space because we'd be left to our own vices. And that's really what I want to talk about today. I want to really focus this morning on another vital trait whom the Holy Spirit is, and he is power. And I want to say this, I believe his power is the least exercised by a believer. When I say exercised, I mean this, it's less used, it's less handled, it's less taken up. We look to God to do all of these things in life. When we are new Christians, we look to him for everything. And I'm not saying now that I've been a Christian for over 35 years that I don't. I do look to him for everything. But now I know there are things that he's empowered me, that he's graciously given to me, that he's given to us as sons and daughters and Christians that we don't have to necessarily go to him, but yes, we rely on his power. It's not that I say, oh, now that I've got it, I don't come to you. No, like Jesus, he had all power and authority, but every night would go to be with his father and would speak about the day that was coming. I'm not talking about not going to him. I'm talking about understanding what he's given you. Does that make sense? And, and I believe, like I said, that it's the least exercised uh, trait by a believer. Why? I believe that most don't understand the tangible reality of this invisible grace. Because we can't see it, we don't understand it. And because we don't see it, we're thinking, okay, well, I'm just going to leave it alone. So by default, we move away from personally pursuing his power. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. They're saying, John, I don't pursue his power, I pursue him. Well, let me tell you, if you're pursuing him, he has power to give you. I'm not talking about pursuing miracles. I'm not talking about pursuing uh, signs and wonders. I'm talking about pursuing him and the power that he gives you so that in your way, should someone need prayer, you can. Should someone need deliverance, you can. You're not chasing that. You are pursuing him, but he is here to give you power to give you authority. And that's what I want to talk about today. I really want to break that down here today. And we're not going to get it all today. We're not going to get it all, but you're going to hear it. And my prayer is that you'll catch it and you'll begin to pursue him. For others, I sense it's because it shields them. And what I mean by that is they can hide in the shadows of excuses. Remember last week we talked about, hey, we're not here to make excuses. And I feel like sometimes, because we don't understand it, 
or because we don't want to pursue it, because if we pursue it, what happens is we risk into moving into that territory of exposure of being history makers. Come on, I would rather risk to be a history maker than to hide in the shadows of excuses. And as a church, come on, it's time to get out. It's time to press in. It's time to pursue the Holy Spirit because he is who remains on the earth. Jesus has come and did the work. And thank God Jesus does the work. And we rem- we're, we're reminded in, at Easter time of the work that he did. He died so that you and I would be free to be able to come into the presence of God. But the other thing that he did, not only has he opened up relationship with the Father, he's also given us the power of the Holy Spirit because we are left here on the earth. Had we not needed to stay here on the earth, then we could be zapped off and go to heaven. We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit in heaven, but we need the power of the Holy Spirit on the earth. And thus, he has gifted us and promised us the power of the Holy Spirit to live. And I'm going to explain that in a bit of a summary in a moment. Now, I get that the tension is real. And when I talk about this, that there's trepidation, there's fear. There's even that, oh, gee, if I get this, I've got to carry. There's a responsibility to carry burden. But here's the thing. On the other side of this mediocrity of a life, there is the miraculous. On the other side of that, there's the supernatural. On the other side of that is the power and presence of God that can change a person. On the other side of that is transformation. On the other side of that is influence. Because let me tell you, this world needs the influence of a Christian. Influence of God for good and for God. Because that's the cry I hear in people's lives. Oh, I wish things to change. Well, be the change. Be the change. But I'm not asking you to be the change without the power. Jesus didn't tell his disciples to be the change until they got the power. He says, don't do anything until you got, got the power. So what makes you so special? What makes me so special? I've got to have the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm not some superman, but I have the superman inside of me called the Holy Spirit. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit power. Now, like I said, before we move on, I want to briefly explain the five different graces of power. Did you know that there's five different graces of power? Now, like I said today, we're not going to get it all today. But I want to just share this, and, and, and it's on the screen, and maybe you can uh, go through it again. But it will help you understand the Holy Spirit's place in your life. He's not this Holy Spirit that just fluts around the earth. But he's come to reside Remember what Jesus said in John's gospel, that I myself, my Father, and the Holy Spirit will what? Make their what? Home in you. So they reside in you. And some of us don't understand who's living in us. Some of us have locked, you know, the, you know that cupboard that when you, each time you move, we've moved 13 times, by the way, and that cupboard or under the stairs that you never look. You never look until it's time to pack. And then, oh, yeah, there you are. I feel like sometimes we do that with the Holy Spirit. We do everything ourselves. We run around. We do life. We get married without asking. We do business and we do this and everything fails. And also, God, where are you? I'm under the stairs. I'm under the stairs. And I'm saying we've got to open that door. We've got to clean out the rubbish and say, Holy Spirit, here I am. I'm ready. It's time. Come on, church. It's time. So you may or may not be aware that our English language is limited. Okay, I'm not talking about the Australian slang. There's plenty in that. I'm talking about the English language is limited. In its word translation, especially when it comes to foreign languages and ancient foreign languages, we're limited for words like love. We've just got one word and we use that I love cake I love the Prime Minister. Well, maybe we don't. I love North Melbourne. Yeah, come on. But we we use that word. I love my wife. We use that word for a number of things. And when we read the Bible about the power of the Holy Spirit, we only 
read it and we think about it in one dimension. But for us today, just quickly, so we can get some correct translation on the word power, I want to look at some of the words through Hebrew, Aramaic, and then translated in the Greek. Through the scripture, to understand its context and correct use and relevance. Not for information's sake, so that you would understand the power that's in you. The five graces of power that lives in you. So we're going to put them up on the board. And the first word here that explains one of the graces of power is ischus. And that's found 11 times in the Bible. And this power speaks of strength and inner fortune. Let me tell you today, you need strength to come to church. You need ischus power to get here. Some of us don't have it. Sorry, let me rephrase it. Some of us don't use it. Some of us don't handle it. We think about where we're at rather than say to the Holy Spirit, I need you. I need you to get me to church. This is what Mark 12, 30 says. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Ishka's power. It's strength, inner fortitude that God gives us, inner fortitude. Now, I've heard people say, well, this is impossible. You can't love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I'm not telling you to be perfect. The Bible doesn't say to be perfect. He just says, will you love me? With the strength that I've given you to love me? Will you love me? Ishka's power. Number two, energia. How many of us need energy? This is found eight times in the Bible. This power speaks of working energy, supernatural energy. Ephesians 3, 7, By God's grace and mighty power, energy, I have given, I've been given the privilege of serving Him by spreading the good news. How many times do I hear people say, I'm burnt out serving God? Please, I'm not mocking. The reality is we burn out by serving God because it's in our own energy, not by the power of God, energy that he gives us. Does that make sense? So if you're feeling pretty crappy and this is happening to you a lot, I'm telling you, you are not running on energy, you're running on your own energy, not by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is good news. The third one is kratos, found 16 times in the Bible. This power speaks of ruling over, having dominion, overseeing others. God's given that to us when it comes to people that we look after as a business. You're a business owner. He's given you uh, power to rule over, but not manipulation, not control, but oversee. This is the overseeing power. And Judges 5.13 says, Then he made him that remains have dominion, kratos power, over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. This is Barak speaking. This is Barak having dominion over God's enemies, the Canaanites. And he had dominion, had authority over these because God gave him the power, kratos power. And the fact of the matter remains, this power is in you and I. But we need to handle it. We need to pick it up. The next two powers are the most common powers we do life with, but unfortunately, many of us don't do it. And when I say this, I mean, because I've been speaking the way I have speaking as a church, as believers, if we want to see change, we've got to be the change, but we can't be the change in our own strength. We've got to be the change in the strength of the Holy Spirit. But if we don't know that he's in us and the the graces aren't in us, well, then we're not going to proceed. Remember that. You won't proceed. If you don't have enough money, you won't proceed. If you don't have enough information, you won't proceed. It's the same thing. If you don't don't think you have the fullness of God, the power of God, you're not going to proceed in that thing. You're going to shy away. You're going to say, it's not for me. It's for the pastor. It's for that person. He's more anointed. No, you are anointed. But we need to pick it up. We need to handle it. And this is exousia. This is found 102 times in the Bible. This power speaks of authority delegated authority that's passed on. Do you know that authority has been passed on to you? Do you know that Jesus passed on authority to his disciples? Have a listen to this in Timothy. 
2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, authority, authoritative power, and love, and of a sound mind. He's not given us fear. That's not from Him. But what He has given you is authority to say, Hey, hang on a second. You haven't given me that. God's delegated me authority. And I'm going to pass that on. I'm not going to pass on fear. I'm going to pass on authority. And you have that. Then there's dunamis. Dunamis I spoke about last week. That's found 117 times in the Bible. This power speaks of the ability that we have been given. The inherent power. The power stored up inside of us like dynamite ready to explode. And I'm telling you, it's time to explode, church. That's what happened at Pentecost. People exploded. The disciples exploded. They had the dynamis power in them and exploded. Why did things happen exponentially there? Because they allowed the power of the Holy Spirit to live through them. Boldness came on them. They weren't scared of what people said if they prayed in tongues. What? They didn't worry about what people said. But they went with the power of God. And the power of God gave them humility but also gave them favour and people were saved, the Bible speaks about. Dunamis, but you shall receive dunamis power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what happens when you get dunamis power? You'll be witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Church, if we want to be that church, we need to realise that God's given us this power and it's time for us to take it up and begin to handle it. There's just one more verse that I want to share where we see both, like I said, these are the two that really as Christians should be prevalent in our life. We see these two dunamis and exousia used together in Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you power. This is exousia power, authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and and over all the power, dunamis, the ability of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Here's the thing. God has given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. What do they represent? They represent those things that try and sting you personally and try and sting you corporately. As a church, as a family, as a business, you personally, you have the authority to to put your foot on them. Like Jesus bruised the heel of the serpent, it's the same authority that you have. The same authority to stand on it. To stand and say, hang hang on a second, I have the authority about, over this. I'm not going to allow that into my house. I, I'm not going to allow this talk, this chatter. Hey kids, you know what? The authority God's given this household needs to be respected. And if you come under that authority, guess what? There's protection, there's provision, there's blessing. Do you understand? To tread on serpents and over all other power. So let me tell you now, there is an ability that the enemy has. There is an ability that the enemy has, but here's the thing. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Meaning that God's dunamis, God's power is greater than the enemy's. And there's nothing that the enemy can do, can come, can say that will overtake you. Should you pick up your dunamis power. Come on, now it's kind of like Star Wars here. Are you going to lay down and get, get lasered by that? No, he's saying, I've given you power. I've given you the authority. In fact, speak to it. These days we can speak to it in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is on the name of Jesus. And I speak Jesus. And in Jesus' name, you have no authority over my life, over my wife, over my family, over my household, over my business, over my church. In Jesus' name, you are defeated. You are just a noise. But let's not listen to that noise. Let's listen to the Word of God and let's take up the Word of God. So here's the thing. And what I love this, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Everybody say nothing. Nothing by any means can hurt you. Nothing by any means, whatever means it comes from, it cannot hurt you because you have the dunamis and the exousia power. You have the power of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. And you walk in the ways of God. So what can come against you? Romans 8 says, nothing can come against you. Shall sickness, it may come, but it cannot bring me down unless God says it's time for me to go. 
So why are we focusing on those things that are happening instead of speaking? And that's why I said to my sister here this morning, I'm not going to let that rest. You're coming out here today after the meeting. I'm praying for you. Because guess what? Jesus' name is higher than any other name. Any other sickness is higher than any other authority. So here's the thing. We can look around the world today and, and state, how bad the world is, morally, culturally, even spiritually speaking. And you can have the theories of why are things breaking down. And I'm sure we can sit here and have those theories, which is okay. Or, like some others, you can even ask, why does it seem that the devil is getting stronger? I've heard people say that. Why is the devil getting stronger? But here's, here's the thing. The fact is, the devil is the same devil that first betrayed God in the very beginning. So he ain't getting stronger. Here's the news flash. The church is acting weaker. I'm not saying that the church is weaker because we're not. But we are acting weaker. We are not acting in the authority that God's given us. We're not acting. Look, a, a, a person who is a policeman, that's his job. He's not a policeman. It's his office. When he takes off those clothes, do you know what? He's not a policeman, although they swear to uphold the truth. And even when I don't wear the uniform, I'm a policeman. They're not. They think they are, but they have no authority. Because if they walked around in plain clothes, most of them would not be able to withhold anyone else. People would go them, right? Even nowadays, even with a, with a, with a, a badge, you don't mean anything anyway. That's how we've gotten but the authority is the badge the authority is the suit the authority is the office but when you're not in those clothes you have no authority and what happens is church when we're not in the power of the holy spirit we have no authority we're loved we're going to heaven but we're going defeated and and i don't want you as an individual in your home in your personal life with your family to live defeated. I don't want you as part of this church seeing Center Point Church live in defeat. We want to li live in the power of the Holy Spirit that has come to overcome the world. And that's your office and that's your authority. So some of you have said, and I've even, people have come to me and said, well, and I've said to them, let's just say you're correct in saying that sin is getting greater. Because I've heard people, sin's getting greater. Let's just say you're correct. I'll give you that. I've still got good news for you. Because Romans 5.20 tells us that we're still at the advantage. Because Romans 5.20 says, because sin is on the increase, grace is even on a greater increase. So you can't get ahead of the power of God. And the power of God's in you. So this, this enemy, this one who comes to kill, to steal and destroy, whether it be your faith, your family, whether it be your, your, your gifting, whether it be whatever it is, excuse me, whatever it is, I'm getting a bit old, I can't even lift my leg. Whatever it is, Holy Spirit, give me strength. What, whatever it is, God's always going to be in front. Aren't you happy about that? I'll tell you what I am. There's such an assurance so church, it's not due to the lack of power supply. How many have been in a, in a place where they've turned off your power? Mate, nowadays, you just get, you get cooked, don't you? You don't know what to do. But it's not due to lack of power supply from God that the world's in trouble. In fact, I think we're part of the problem. We're part of the problem. We blame the enemy, but we're part of the problem because we're not picking up the mantle of the five graces that God's given us, the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's a thought. Could it possibly be that the church is not fully being the church? By not exercising exousia, which is our designated authority, and dynamis, which is our inheritability that God's given us, the power that He's given us. Can you just imagine this? Just kind of uh, amuse me. Can you imagine this? Can you just close your eyes for a minute as I quote this? Can you imagine what would happen the moment the church starts exercising in the power of God? 
The moment the church rises up to its prophetic potential. The moment that Christians don't speak Christianese, but we start actioning Pentecostal Christianity. The moment we just don't go to church, but we be the church. The moment we love, lead and live out of what we read and not just consume the sermon on a Sunday, but we contribute as well. The moment we diligently seek God from a Monday to Saturday, occupying and operating in His promises. The moment we conquer new territories for Him. The moment we take up the mantle of being the light in the midst of darkness. You can open your eyes, those that have closed it. Can you imagine? What would we see? I think we would see an effective change in the atmosphere. It would be a godly change. Things would become different when you speak to people. That hardness wouldn't be so hard. And I'll tell you why, because we are speaking what we want to see. Remember this, the same power that was in Jesus Christ now lays in you. And I said last week, greater things shall you do because I go to the Father and He will send you another called the Holy Spirit, who is the power of God. So imagine us speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit and speaking what we want to see. Church, this would be a different place. This would be a different place. Our families would look differently. Our businesses would be different. Our fellowships would be totally different. We would see generations saved. We would see our nation turned to Jesus. Come on. The power of God will cause you to stop to look towards the darkness. And it will gracefully transition you and your activity towards the light. Can we all stand up this morning? I believe that God's speaking to some of us this morning. I think He's speaking to us and telling us, hey, it's time to turn around. It's time to walk out. You might say, oh, what does that mean? I'm saying it's time to walk out of your past for some of us. For some of us, it's time to walk out of our pain. Fathers, it's time to walk out of your worries. Some of you are carrying worries. He's saying it's time to walk out. It's time to walk out on your drama. And for some of us, it's time to walk out on your fears. Now, I know that some of us have been trying to do that. I'm not here to condemn anybody. It's not what I'm here to do. What I'm here to do is to bring truth that maybe some of us have not seen before. I'm not telling you to do this on your own. It's impossible. I, I couldn't do it on my own. I haven't been able to do it on my own. I've only been able to carry. I've only been able to go. I've only been able to walk because of the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of the things that we've done in the life of this ministry weren't me. I know that a lot of people tend to give me uh, kudos for it. It hasn't been me, trust me. I'm fallen, I'm frail, I'm fickle. I'm a year 10 dropout. And I'm not smart at all. But what I am is I pursue the power of God in my life. And I want that for you. And you might be in saying that you are. That's great. Keep, keep going that way. But maybe there's people today that you've said, I've given it a go, John, but it just hasn't worked. I'm still stuck. Well, can I just say to you today that although fear may have ca uh, captured you and you've tried to do it on your own and you know what, you haven't succeeded, so you are just about to give up. Can I just say to you, church, can I ask you to have another go again today? Can I ask you to have another go? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand with you in agreement. Because my Bible tells me when two or three agree touching one point, it shall be. It's the Bible. I want to agree with you. But, but this time, not only will I agree with you, what I want you to do is, what I want you to do is, I want you to do it with God's power with His exousia, with His authority. 
So whatever that thing may be, I, I don't know. Maybe it's a, a, fini- a financial issue that, you know what, you just can't. It just has got you. And you haven't been able to have the strength and you've given up. With the authority of God, speak to Him. I don't come as John. I come as the Son of the Most High God. And the authority that God's given to me, I speak to this in the dynamis power of God, in the ability that God's given me. And I say, I'm done with you. You have no more authority over my life. That's what I'm talking about tonight, today. And what happens is when we do this, He gives you the power now to turn around. Not to face that anymore. It's not going to become a burden. It's not going to be something you think about day and night while you're working. You can't get to sleep. You know that stuff that just got you? You'll be able to turn from that. You'll have a good night's sleep. You'll be able to plan. You'll be able to see the other side of mediocrity with that in your life and the miraculous will start to happen because it's the power of God, not by what you've done, but because you've agreed to take up the power of God and walk out once and for all, never to return. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? To walk away from that thing, never to return. And that's because you've now make it, making a decision to take it up, whether it be worry, fear, whatever it might be in your life, For some, it may be something small. For others, it might be something large. But at the end of the day, as the Bible says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Whatever's happening in your life, you will make it what it is. But let me tell you, it's not greater than God. Because the power of God is laying in you. It's time for you. I noted down here in my notes, it's time to dare to be a Daniel. What did Daniel do? He was in the, the den facing those lions, roaring at him. He just decided to turn around. And let me tell you, Daniel could not have turned around unless he had the power of God in his life. He would have taken, been taken by that fear and trembling. But he decided, oh yeah, that's fine. But my God is what? Greater than the mouths of the lions. I'm just going to turn around and do what God has called me to do, and that is pray. And that's a beautiful picture. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Daniel with his back in the lions, praying. Because his decree was, the king said, I'm not going to get, you're not allowed to pray anymore. What? You're not going to stop me praying, Daniel said. Well, you're going in the lion's den. Okay, O king, do whatever you got to do. Got in there. The Bible says that while the lions were roaring, he was praying and God shut the mouth of the lions. Come on, do you want God to shut down your lion? It's time for you to come to him this morning. It's time for you to come. Come on, we're going to sing this song. Some of us need to create this room. This upper room that we sung in our first song, it's a new song, but the words are so powerful. And this is, there's room here. And we need to change the way we see who we are as a son and daughter of God and take up the graces of power that God's given us. It doesn't matter whether you're a brand new Christian. In fact, today, if you don't know Jesus, you need to come. For the first time, if you're here for the first time and you've never received Jesus, will you make that first step? Will you come to Him this morning and I'll pray with you. Let's sing this.